Dean and Tyler Listel are registered investment advisor representatives. Investment advisory services offered through Brokers International Financial Services, LLC, member SIPC. Brokers International Financial Services, LLC, and Secure Retirement Solutions, LLC are not affiliated companies. It's time for Secure Retirement Solutions with your hosts, Dean and Tyler Listel, fully licensed retirement specialists from Secure Retirement Solutions in Green Bay. Now, here are your hosts, Dean and Tyler. Good morning and thank you for joining us today. Tyler and I will discuss topics that affect your retirement, such as investments, income planning, social security, and much more. Good morning, Ty. How are you? Good morning, Dean. I'm doing great. How about yourself? Good. Thank you. Uh, Today, we're going to talk about uh, what you should look for when choosing a mutual fund. Uh, Part of the reason we talk about mutual funds as much as we do is it's one of the most popular investments uh, or one of the most popular vehicles, I guess, you can put into an investment. And part of the reason is even if you self-manage your own account, mutual funds still have managers that oversee um, the investments that go into a mutual fund. So many times uh, a mutual fund is probably the easiest way to start accumulating wealth in a portfolio. But uh, we're going to dig right in and look at some of the things that you should look at when choosing a mutual fund or things that you should know when discussing your portfolio with your advisor. The first thing is, what are the fund's investment objectives? Now, the reason we, we, we put it this way is there are a lot of different mutual funds that try to address any number of things as far as your investment objectives are concerned. There are mutual funds that are bond related, all stock related, uh, a combination of two called balance funds. There are different sector funds and so on. But Tyler, let's talk about some of the basics that we look at when uh, determining the investment objectives in the mutual funds. Yeah, Dean, so um, when it comes down to looking for or choosing a mutual fund, what do you wanna look for? Um, We bring this topic up because whether you have your 401k or 403b at work where you have different funds to choose from or your IRA or Roth IRA, many people out there in retirement accounts and even non-retirement accounts have access to mutual funds, and it's a common question that we get, well, what do I look for when choosing one? So again, like you said, Dean, we're first gonna start with the investment objectives of mutual funds. And what what you need to do first and foremost before getting into any of the fees, performance, anything like that, is you wanna de- uh, determine how conservative or aggressive the fund is and how it fits into your overall strategy. So you're probably going to want to have a financial plan so you know what's going on, so you know how to invest. And that will determine if you're more conservative, moderate, aggressive, and you can pick funds based on that. Now, all mutual funds are managed based on certain investment objectives that may or may not fit your uh, financial plan or your strategy. Okay, Tyler, one thing I want to throw in there when you talk about uh, uh, whether you're conservative or aggressive, um, the, the thing is you should go through a risk analysis with your advisor or on your own when you start picking a family of investments. You can go online and find samples of risk analysis uh, questionnaires out there. And the reason we, we, we like to have everybody go through a risk analysis is Many times uh, we will ask somebody who comes in and, and talks to us about uh, investing with us and so on, and we'll ask, you know, what, what do you think your risk tolerance is? And it's it's really interesting and eye-opening because a lot of people will say, well, I'm conservative only to find out they grade moderate, or I'm aggressive and find out that they grade uh, moderate or conservative. So really many times it's what a particular um, uh, investor feels at that time uh, or sometimes they will just slant their feelings or opinions towards what they think they should uh, feel like or answer. But really, go through a risk analysis. You can find these, uh, like I said, sample questionnaires online. Yeah, Dean, good good point there. Um, with that said, there's a number of different types of funds that we're going to get into that you can choose from within your 401k, your retirement plan, or outside of that in an IRA or Roth IRA, or even a non-retirement account. Um, there's usually seven or eight, and the first one being aggressive growth funds is one of the categories. Now, aggressive growth funds, those are typically small or mid-cap. They're they're comprised comprised of small or mid-cap stocks that are used for growth. So that's usually in the high-risk category, and the name aggressive growth kind of implies that. But you have smaller and uh, middle-sized companies that are focused on growth potential, 
and the fund buys into a bunch of, like I said, smaller mid cap size stocks. So that would be the probably the most aggressive that you could get the aggressive growth funds. Then there's also just plain old growth funds. And with growth funds, they invest in large cap U.S. stocks used for growth potential. So again, that's your large U.S. companies um, that probably have been around for a number of years, but yet they, they're going to be less volatile than some smaller mid cap stocks, but they still offer good growth potential over the long term. Um, you're also going to have growth and income funds. So that might be dividend paying stocks used for growth or income that can be taken in the form of dividends that can either be used as income or reinvested right back into the fund. So um, growth and income, it's probably a little bit less volatile than growth, but yet it can still offer that growth potential over the long term as well. Um, and then you also have balance funds. Now balance funds are a balance between um, stocks and bonds within one. So hence the name balanced, it's balanced between stocks which are used again for growth potential and then bonds which can be used for stability, um, and income as well. So balance funds are going to be a bit more conservative than your growth funds or pure stock funds because you have some bonds added in there. So with a balance fund, you're not going to see the um, ups and downs of growth stock funds. But at the same time, that's what many people kind of um, opt for when they're getting closer to retirement. Um, there's also sector funds are, are another one. And sector funds are becoming much more popular um, and what I mean by sector funds is you have all the different finance or all the different sectors out there in the market. For example, technology, um, financial services, telecommunications, banks, consumer staples, and that fund will invest only in stocks of certain sectors. Now, with the emergence of a lot of the technology companies and the growth that that a lot of tech stocks have had, really since you know the last de over the last decade since two thousand eight. Sector funds, and like I said, especially tech, healthcare, biotechnology have really become popular because you can buy into one fund and you can have exposure to a hundred different tech stocks that you might not otherwise have or have the time and research to, to go and buy individual stocks here. So again, sector funds, you can invest in a bunch of different sectors with one mutual fund. Um, just a couple more we have here, bond funds. Now, bonds are used for income, stability, and preservation. They're, they're what many people have in their portfolios as they age and get into retirement. Okay, and Tyler, you brought, uh, you brought up a good point as far as preservation when it comes to bond funds. But Tyler and I are always quick to, uh, to let people know that do not always fall into the rut of thinking that bond funds are safe. Okay, there's a difference between conservative preservation and, and safety. And many times people are disappointed that um, their bond positions are going down in value. They're losing money. They can understand that. So don't just buy into the fact that bonds are safe, okay? Typically conservative. Usually when you have conservative, that does equal safer, but not exclusively. So understand that uh, bonds are in there for some protection. They're mainly in there for income, but do not uh, think that bonds are, are safe all the time. Yeah, good point there, Dean. Um, and then lastly, you also can have em, um, international or emerging market funds. And those invest, um, hence the name, in stocks that are international companies, so not based in the U.S. Those are going to be right up there with aggressive growth funds as one of the more risky funds out there. But again, if you want to be diversified, it might be a good idea to have some in there. Probably not a whole lot. There were many aggressive growth funds and international funds that lost over 70 to 80 percent. So again, you've got to you've got to be able to stomach that um, if that does happen. And if you're not, if you don't have that risk tolerance, then you might be better served in a balanced fund or um, a portion to allocated to bond funds. So again, you want to make sure that whatever funds you're selecting, they fit within your risk tolerance. And many people ask, you know, well, what's the right one for me? And it does depend on your goals, your time horizon, your age, your risk tolerance, among some other things. But for example, someone who's in their working years, they might be 20, in their 20s, 30s, or 40s, they might have 25% allocated to aggressive growth funds, 25% allocated to growth funds, 25% allocated to growth and income funds, and 25% allocated to international funds. Whereas someone who's retired, they might have 40% in bonds, 
30% growth and 30% growth in income. So as you can see, the retired person might stay away from aggressive growth funds or international funds just because that doesn't align with their objectives. They don't need that aggressive growth right now. They're more so focused on income, um, some preservation, and some, some moderate growth, whereas someone who's in their working years, they can go heavier into aggressive growth funds, international funds, growth funds, and they might want to stay away from bonds or balance funds just because they have much more growth potential and they can um, stomach that risk over the long term. So again, what's best for you really all depends on where you're at. It's never a, a one size fits all, so to speak, when it comes to choosing mutual funds. It's all going to depend on where you're at right now. Okay, Tyler, uh, one other point here too that you, you sort of um, brought to my attention and that is when you look at mutual funds, you have all of these different selections. However, we have seen from time to time where somebody would come in and want to talk to us about uh, uh, their their existing portfolio, and you'll see a fifty or sixty thousand dollar portfolio holding ten to fifteen different mutual funds. Remember, more isn't always better when it comes to mutual funds, and the reason being is there's a term called correlation. Uh, or overlap. And what that means is you look at the individual mutual funds and you compare them to the other holdings in the portfolio. And many times these mutual funds might have the same 10 or 15 uh, largest holdings that are the same between mutual fund companies. So again, more isn't always better. Have your advisor uh, explain to you what correlation means and make sure you don't have significant correlation. Um, but we do see those out there. Okay, the next thing we're going to talk about is the fund's fee structure. This is something that is always discussed, and there are some mistakes that people make in thinking uh, they understand the fee structure in mutual funds. Now, many mutual funds are held in um, uh, managed accounts. In other words, you have an investment advisor that might be charging you to manage the account and give you advice and do financial plans that's fine. That's good. That's what we do. Um, but then they also have a number of mutual funds in there that carry significant internal fees. So you have to look at the internal fees of the investment plus the advisory fee when you determine whether this is a good portfolio for you or not. However, on the flip side though, and I'm speaking out of both sides of my mouth, and, and what I mean by that is there are some mutual funds that do have some internal fees that sometimes I don't really feel comfortable with when you just look at it from a mathematical standpoint, but their returns are significant. So you need to be aware of those things. Ask your advisor about that. Um, if you have a portfolio right now and you don't know how to read it to find out what the internal fees are, or you're not in touch with your advisor, give us a call, stop in our office. We'd be more than happy to take a look at that and give you a complimentary uh, review, let you know what we think of the portfolio. But let's talk about fee structures at this point. Again, this is one that many people should be aware of is how to determine internal fees of a mutual fund. Tyler, let's talk about some of the basics such as expense ratios. Yeah, so the second thing to look for um, when choosing a mutual fund would be the fund's fee structure. Um, so after you have, or after you've decided what your investment objectives are and which fund category you want to go with, then you're going to want to look at all the funds in that category. You're going to want to look at the fee structure. So uh, first off, all mutual funds have internal expenses and something that's called an expense ratio is what measures those. And it's important to know what you're paying within your mutual fund. So um, again, an expense ratio is the ongoing cost of the fund for management. So with mutual funds, there are mutual fund managers that make decisions that either buy or sell stocks within the fund because a mutual fund is really, it's like a basket of 100 or 200, however many different stocks and or bonds. And there's a mutual fund manager that is constantly either buying new ones or selling exi existing ones off and it's, they're managing it for you. So they charge an internal fee for management that many people are um, unaware of. And again, that's the expense ratio. Now you can find that um, if you go look at your 401k statement, your IRA statement, there's usually a ticker symbol or even just the name of the fund. Even if you just Google that, it'll show up right there on Google. You can go to Yahoo Finance, you, you can go to Morningstar, and it'll show you right then and there what the expense ratio is so you know what you're paying for it. Um, usually expense ratios, they can range anywhere from 0.1% to 2% or greater per year. And again, those are internal fees. Now, if it's usually the ones that are on the lower end, such as the 0.1%, 
though from what I've seen, those are typically index funds. And what that means are different mutual funds that simply follow an index like the S&P 500. Um, there's, there's a number of different bond in indexes, balanced indexes, but all they do is they simply track an index. There's really no active management going on where the manager isn't buying or selling based on the, the stock market or different economic events. They simply track an index. So if they're tracking an index and there's not a lot of management going on, they're not going to charge you a lot for it. Whereas on the other hand, if there's a, fee, or a fund that's um, a fee that's over one and a half to two percent per year or greater, usually those are um, funds where the managers are either making a lot of moves, therefore charging more money for it, or they might be um, an international small cap fund, for example, where the fund manager has to do uh, much more extensive research to try and buy and sell different stocks if they're going internationally and small cap on top of that. So um, it might depend on the type of fund you you choose um, in terms of the fee percentage. Now, again, all funds have that internal expense ratio, but in addition to that, there are some funds that do have transaction fees, and transaction fees are usually termed as a front-end load or a back-end load. Now, a front-end load is where when you invest in a fund, there's a percentage that comes right off the front. It might be four and a half, five, five and a half percent that they take right off the front end and what happens then is they take that amount off the front end, but then your expense ratio is going to be lower over time because you paid the front end fee. A share, that's termed as an A share, and A shares are usually what you want when you're looking in a retirement account or you have a long-term holding period. Again, that's A shares are front end load. Um, the other popular transaction fee fund would be a C share. C shares um, can charge what's called a back-end load, usually if you sell them off with, within 12 months or a year. So if you invest in C-shares, you don't pay anything up front, but you pay a higher expense ratio throughout the life of the fund, and then if you want to sell it off within one, one year, you have to pay that back-end load. But if you keep it for um, longer than one year, you don't have to pay the back-end load, but you get charged that higher expense ratio. So uh, C-shares are best used for shorter holding periods, even though that you don't have to pay that front end load again due to the internal fee. Okay, good points, Tyler. Before we talk about no load um, mutual funds, we're gonna take a quick break. You're listening to Dean and Tyler Listel, investment advisors with Secure Retirement Solutions located on Allied Street in Green Bay. For a complimentary review of your current investments, or if you have questions, please call them at 920-347-9888 or go to their website at srsplans.com. Okay, um, Tyler talked about A shares. He talked about uh, C shares, talked about you know the internal fees. Um, we also hear from people, uh, uh, they'll come in and they'll say, well, I, ha I don't pay anything in my uh, mutual fund because it's a no load. Tyler, let's you know explain a little bit about the no load situation, really how that works. Um, and also, I want our listeners to understand uh, load really equals a commission. Okay, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that um, it, it uh, eliminates the fees within the mutual fund. Yeah, Dean. So there's the the A shares, C shares, and then no load funds. <clears throat> no load funds is where you don't pay that front end. Um, load or commission or the back end commission, um, but that doesn't necessarily make them better because in addition to the fees, you have to take into consideration a number of other things that we're going to get into, such as the performance, the turnover, the tax efficiency or inefficiency. But again, no load funds simply are where you don't pay that front end um, load but you're still gonna have an expense ratio. And usually with no load funds, you have to go out on your own and get them. You can't get them through um, an advisor. Usually, again, you usually have to, or through um, someone else that's managing it, you usually have to go out and get them through your own, or on your own, you have to go to you know Vanguard, Direct, TD Ameritrade, Fidelity, whoever the custodian is that you're gonna use. Usually they want you to go direct with them without having an advisor if they're if they're going to charge no load. So um, you have the funds fee structure. Uh, important things to note, you have the internal expense ratio. I encourage everyone to go and um, type in their fund ticker symbol, whether it's the funds that you have within your 401k or your IRA, your Roth IRA. You can go type that in, um, go to Morningstar, Yahoo Finance, even just right on Google, and you can see what you're paying for the funds. And again, um, when it comes to fees, 
You want to. You, you also going to. You're going to want to take into consideration performance, which is what we're going to get into uh, in a little bit here. But usually, when it comes to the fee structure, if you can keep your fees to a minimum, that over time is how you're going to be much more efficient. Okay, Tyler, and you talked about uh, the the funds performance, and we are going to talk about that now. Uh, it used to be you'd have to do all of this work on your own to determine the performance of a fund or a stock, and right now you can find. Um, uh, any uh, exchange-traded fund or mutual fund, as you said, you can find them on Morningstar or Yahoo Finance. And when you look at those, um, understand that it's just showing you past performance. And remember, past performance does not guarantee a future gain, but you still have to look at the history to get a feel for how um, it is done over the, the, the past. But when you look at it, there are a couple things that we'd like you to look at, and that is returns net of expenses. So what that means is they will show you the returns that the mutual fund had in the past after taking out the internal expenses. And again, past performance does not guarantee a future gain, but it does give you a snapshot on what to expect. There are some fund managers that are very well known and seems to be that they do significantly better than other fund managers. So again, you will see some uh, some of these fund managers have been with you know companies and managing a mutual fund for 30 plus years. But Tyler, what else do we look at when we talk about the performance of mutual funds? Yeah, Dean, so again, um, same thing with the fees. You can go on Morningstar, Yahoo Finance, and you can see the performance of various funds over time. You know, you can see a, um, a one, three, five, 10 year track record, um, or since inception. Inception is since the fund was first um, established. You can see all those online. Uh, most times you can also see those on your um, on your statements as well. I see a lot of people who have 401k or 403b statements and it shows right on there the funds that they have and the past track record of performance. So all that is usually available there to you either right on your statement or uh, readily accessible online. So again, you want to you're going to want to check that. And like you said, Dean, past performance is never a guarantee of future results, but it is um, an important consideration to keep in mind when researching mutual funds. Um, with that, we like funds that have a long-term track record of good performance over time, especially when it comes to retirement accounts. Um, I don't care so much about the one-year or year-to-date performance. I want something that's performed good over 5, 10, 15, 20, 30-plus years. That shows me that it's been around long and it's been proven. It sustained a number of different market cycles. Um, so that's what I'm looking at, especially when, again, when you have a 401k, 403b, a Roth IRA, I want to look at the long-term performance numbers. Um, and again, you wanna, you're going to want to keep fees in mind as well, because typically the ones that have lower fees are going to have higher performance because that's more money in your, in your account than the fund managers, um, than the fund manager is taking. So keep that in mind. Um, the other thing with fund performance is, um, the fund performance must fit in line with your investment objectives. And what I mean by that is I've taken a look um, just recently. I had a potential client come in and they had uh, they brought their 401k with them. They were wondering why they only averaged 4 or 5% per year over the last 5 to 10 years. And I looked at their holdings and they had 40% of their account in a money market um, money market fund and the other 60% in short-term bond funds. So again, that those are funds that are mainly used for income and capital preservation. That's not going to give you growth potential. So what you want to you want to pay attention, and this goes back to the first point, um, is your investment objective. You want to pick funds that are going to line up with the performance. So what I mean by that is you won't find conservative funds having a history of high returns, and vice versa. Um, so that's the other thing when it comes to performance. You want to make sure that it's it's in line with your investment objectives. But again, um, when we look at performance, you can go out there, uh, Yahoo Finance, Morningstar, you can type in the fund ticker symbol or the fund name, and it's going to show you the past performance. And especially when you're in a retirement account, I like funds that have had good performance over the long term. I'm looking more so at the long term, term numbers than I am the short term. Okay. Uh, one other thing there too, Tyler, when you talk about how long um, a mutual fund has been in place. As Tyler said, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years, you can look at it. We like to at least see um, a fund 
weather the storm of 2007 through 2009, then you can really get in there and see how the fund managers responded to a significant market downturn. And there are some funds that did very well prior to that time, very well after that time, but did significantly worse than some other funds. Well, you take that into consideration if it's still the same fund manager. But um, again, if they weathered the storm um, relatively well, and again, you know, there's that saying, you know, uh, low tide brings all ships down, high tide brings them all up. You know, that, that uh, time period between 2007, 2009 was a very tough time period, but you can really see how they performed during that, that time period. We like to see that. Yeah, Dean, good, good point there. Um, the last thing that I wanna touch on uh, quickly here, the last couple minutes before we close today's show, is the fund's tax efficiency or inefficiency. That's something, um, one of the last considerations to keep in mind when choosing mutual fund. And what I mean by that is all mutual funds have something called a turnover ratio. And turnover ratio is how often stocks or bonds are bought and sold within the fund. So a low turnover ratio usually is going to be more tax efficient, therefore generating more capital gains if you hold mutual funds in a non-retirement account. Um, and result in lower internal fees due to not as much buying and selling of investments within the fund, whereas a high turnover ratio um, that's less tax efficient due to higher fees for buying and selling investments more frequently. And if you hold your mutual funds in a non-qualified or a non-retirement account, it can also lead to higher capital gains taxes that can affect you as well. It can affect a number of different things too. Um, now, if you hold mutual funds in any type of retirement account, then you don't have to worry about any tax implications until you sell your shares to, uh, to take a withdrawal. But again, if you hold mutual funds in a non-retirement or a non-qualified account, then it's really important that you pay attention to turnover ratio because mutual funds um, can spit out a lot of capital gains and the ones that have higher turnover ratios are going to spit out the most capital gains, whereas the ones that have lower turnover ratios they're gonna be much more tax efficient, um, gonna have much more lower internal fees. So again, um, pay attention to the turnover ratio. That's something that you can also find on Morningstar, Yahoo Finance, another thing to keep in mind when um, looking at mutual funds and determining the right one to choose. Okay, that's all the time we have this week. See you later and hope you'll join us again next week. We'll see you next week. You've been listening to Secure Retirement Solutions with your hosts, Dean and Tyler Listel fully licensed retirement specials from Secure Retirement Solutions in Green Bay. To get more information from Dean and Tyler, contact them at Secure Retirement Solutions on Allied Street in Green Bay. Call 920-347-9888 or visit them at srsplans.com. Securities and investment advisory services offered through Brokers International Financial Services, LLC. Member SIPC. Brokers International Financial Services is not an affiliated company. 